Philippians 2, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. Now, Pastor Tommy Nelson once said, don't lean on a shovel and pray for a hole. Pray, trust God, and then work with all the grace that he gives you. And I love the quote because it's a great image of what Paul is saying to the church in Philippi in light of this glorious declaration that we saw last week and the week before, verses 5 through 11. Don't just lean on the shovel and pray for a hole, but pray and trust and dig with all the might, with all the grace God gives. Now, there is a temptation, even in my own heart, to, to fall off after chapter 11. Because I don't know about you, but in my estimation, it's spectacular. As I've said, Philippians comes in some manner to like a Christological peak in 2, 5 or 2, 6 through 11. And it would be so easy to behold the mystery of the declaration of God's, uh, Christ's humiliation and exaltation. To be so captured by that that we lose the whole point of why Paul articulated that in the first place. We may lose sight of what Paul is doing, but the Apostle Paul did not lose sight of why he said that. Paul, now in these verses, calls us back. He gave us this glorious picture. Then he calls us back to this, uh, to this, to this reality of salvation. And what we have in verses 12 and 13 is a wonderful starting point for what we know, what we call sanctification. Sanctification. Lord willing, you've heard that word before, and all it means is the process of growing in Christ's likeness. Sanctification is that process. It is a grace of God whereby we grow in our image, grow in the image of God, growing in personal holiness. So when we read this passage about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, do not think Paul is saying work to be saved. He did not say work for your own salvation. Hopefully you saw that. And if not, you would see it now. It is impossible to work for your salvation. And believe it or not, I hope you do believe it. It's actually dishonoring to God to try to do so. God has not commanded you to work for your salvation. Instead, this passage says work out your own salvation. Work out your your own salvation. There's a huge difference between working for your salvation and working out your salvation. I want to remind you of some really good news. God worked for your salvation. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit worked for your salvation. And there on the cross, as he died, we know Jesus shouted, it is finished. He's not needing our help now. It is finished. And so what do we do? We receive the finished work of Christ by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. We are saved as we receive that work of Christ. Sanctification is living in light of that. Sanctification is, is understanding, or, or maybe we would better say embracing the reality of a new identity in Christ and living that out. That is, saved people will reflect Christ. Not perfectly, not fully. Nonetheless, we will reflect Christ in our lives. We will show the world that Christ has done something for us and is currently doing something in us. So then true salvation from Christ will be shown in obedience. And maybe one or some got real uncomfortable right there. Because we have a world full of people who say they're Christians and have no obedience. And it is possible that we have some with us today that say, I'm a Christian, and their lives say something else. To be saved is to reflect Christ in some manner. So the Apostle Paul, now in verses 12 and 13, um, he's beginning now to work out the practical realities of what he articulated in Christ. 
So Christ didn't just suffer and die and rise and now be exalted for no reason. There's a reason that these things happen, and that reason should be evidencing itself in us. So he returns to the original concern that he pointed us to back in 127 and 28, where he said, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction. Here we go. But of your salvation and that from God. So he returns to that original concern of unity in Christ. And the unity in Christ is a clear sign of salvation. It's a clear evidence of salvation. So then, verses 12 through 13, what Paul is saying is being sure, being sure that God is working in us, we are to work out the practical realities of our salvation. Did you catch that? That's what 12 and 13 is making clear to us. That, that, that's what we should receive this morning as the will of God for every one of us, being sure that God is working in us. We are to work out the practical realities of our salvation. And he does this by first appealing to these brothers and sisters and then encouraging. Appealing and then encouraging. And so first let's consider this appeal that the Apostle Paul makes to the church in Philippi, the Spirit of the Lord makes to you, to me, this morning. So we read in 2.12, Therefore, or so then, in light of this glorious declaration that I just made about the humility and the exaltation of Christ. So then, or therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and with trem trembling. Paul spoke in a way. This is a servant of the Lord. And we know from the last passage, uh, verse verses uh, uh, 6 through 11, that, that, that Jesus' very nature is that God and that a servant. And Paul now, a servant of the Lord, speaks as Jesus speaks to his people. Therefore, my beloved. This is a tender address. This is a, a deeply affectionate address. And it seems such an address is noticeably absent among the men of the church today. We want to be rough. It's as if we think we can pressure and harass people into obedience to Christ. We can command and shout people into obedience to Christ. We can bully and guilt people into obedience to Christ. But as the heart of Christ is for the people... We, his people, should have that heart. How about we start addressing one another as my beloved, my dearly loved brother or sister in the Lord? How about we start addressing one another, reminding we are dearly loved by our Lord? I wonder, do you want to be commanded and pressured into obedience, or would you rather be appealed and loved? into obedience. The Apostle Paul had the authority of Christ. And so he spoke with the tone of Christ to these people. And I think that's the right use of authority. To appeal, to affectionately draw out what the Lord has instructed. And so he calls them dearly loved. It's a good pattern. It's a pattern that I, I want to grow in. I know it's just easier just to rise up and bark. And I can do that without the Spirit. And it takes the Spirit, and I want to grow in reliance upon the Spirit. Do you? Beloved, do you? You want the heart of Christ going forth out of you? Ask Him. And He's not going to say, goodness gracious, yes, I'll do it. How many times do I have to tell you? He doesn't talk to us that way. He says, of course, of course I'll do that in you. Of course I would love to do that in you, my beloved. So he has this appeal, but it's further strengthened by this word of commendation, this, this affirmation, if you will, where he says, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more 
in my absence. It's like he's saying, I know you will keep being in Christ who you've already proven yourself to be. Even though I'm not with you, I have no doubt you'll be in Christ who you've already proven yourself to be. That's the type of encouragement I know I need. My heart tells me a different story. You're not going to do it this time. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I know you did it before. All the negative, like I said, the world is not kind. My heart is not kind, but our Lord is kind. And through the Apostle Paul, he's saying, I know what you're going to do. Come on, let's get after it. You've always obeyed in my presence. I know you'll obey in my absence. The Apostle Paul was about 600 miles away. There was no Zoom. There was no FaceTime. There was a letter that he sent by hand, by boat, and at some point later, it would get to him. And Paul wrote the letter knowing that he knew that he knew they were going to joyfully strive for unity through humility by and for the gospel. He had no doubt in his mind. And so he appeals to them, do this in my absence. Now, at this point, I want to remind us of some things. Where we see loving God's people, we see a fruit, not the root, okay? Where we see a people loving God's people, we see the fruit that God's love has been planted in them. God's love has been rooted and grounded in them. Where we see brothers, sisters, where we see those obeying God's word, we're seeing a fruit that comes from the root of having a new heart. Now you may think, what on earth is he even talking about? The reason I say that is because what we're going to read next here in, in 2.12 has been misunderstood by many, sadly misunderstood, twisted throughout the centuries. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, we already read 128, where he said that their unity is a clear sign of their salvation, and that is from God, right? Unity getting along with one another inside a local family, a local body of followers called the local church is an evidence. It's a fruit of their salvation from God. It's an evidence of salvation from God. So hear me. I'm going to say a lot today. (laughs) Shocker. (laughs) But hear me. Salvation is from God. And I hope your heart says amen. Salvation is from God. And salvation is something we work out. Something we flesh out. Salvation is something we grow up into. And I take that language from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 and 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 2 through 3. If you want to note that and go reflect on them later. But both of those passages, one from Paul, one from Peter. He's telling these brothers and sisters to grow up into Christ. To grow up into Christ. That is, salvation is the work of God, and it does something in you, and it will be evidenced as you grow up in that salvation. So Paul here, in verses, uh, in in Philippians 2.12, he is referring to salvation, not as the crossing over from death to life, the regeneration to being born again. That's not what Paul is saying in 2.12. Rather, what Paul is saying in 2.12, what he's speaking of when he says salvation is how saved people live out the faith that saved them. Salvation in 2.12 is referring to how saved people live out the faith that saved them. So he's not saying work for, he's saying work out our salvation. I've said this before, but it's worth saying again. In the Bible, the word saved or even even the the, the word uh, salvation is used in one of three ways, not just one way. It's not a single speed bicycle with a front sprocket and a back sprocket. It's got a front sprocket and three back sprockets. You even know what I'm talking about, a bicycle? (laughs) Okay, it's not single speed. He's using the word salvation in one of three ways, the Bible is. First is... um, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. That's justification. Second is I am currently being saved from the power of sin over me. That's sanctification. And the third way that saved salvation is used is one day I will be saved from the presence of sin. That's glorification. Justification, sanctification, glorification. And Paul right here is speaking of that second category. 
I am being saved from the power of sin. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to self. But I'm being saved. I'm being set free. I'm living out the faith that saved me. He's referring again how saved people are to live out the faith that saved them. Do you think Christ saved you to leave you in sin? That's a ridiculous question. I know it is. But so many of us live that way. He died the death we deserve for sin. And we remain in it. As if that were his aim. But when he died for us, when he atoned for our sins, he, he was providing salvation for us, giving us a new heart, giving us the spirit of the living God to take up resonance in us. And he enabled us to increasingly reject sin, that is, increasingly reject selfish ambition, and to increasingly embrace holiness, such as trusting God and looking out for the interests of others. Or the way my first pastor would say it is... In this life, we'll never be sinless, but we should sin less. Does that resonate into your heart? And do you see that progress in the faith in your life? Yes, there's an ongoing struggle you're going to have until the bitter end. But it is the will of God for us to make progress. To die to sins and to walk in faith and obedience to Christ. And so then Paul says, I'm appealing to you, work it out. I just, I want to ask you, are you working it out? So many of us just meander through this world. We're just drifting through this world. And it's no wonder we still give ourselves to sin. We're leaning on the shovel, praying for a hole. And when you give the quote, we laugh. But when we look in the mirror and we realize, oh, he was talking to me. It hurts. It's embarrassing. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Flesh it out. Together. See, I bet you so many of us heard everything I said up until this point as me and Jesus. But the language here is plural. Your salvation is plural. Work it out together. Because remember, after all, the whole point of this was they together were struggling to get along. You see, the, the local church is the primary platform for working out your salvation. Yes, there's an individual aspect to it. But there's a corporate aspect as well. We should individually ensure that our hearts are truly reconciled to Christ and that we have surrendered all to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is no personal rebellion in any one of our hearts, that we are not willfully, knowingly testing God. We should individually do that. But then collectively, together, we should ensure that we are not looking out for our own interest, that we are looking to the interest of others. Do you realize Black Mountain Baptist Church exists for the glory of God and this community? Not for you, not for me. I wonder, do you come to be a part of this family week by week by week with, with the, the, the primary function thought of consuming or serving? Ouch. Did you wake up this morning? Lord, turn my heart from the natural instinct to consume to being consumed with Christ. Turn from take to give. I'm going to pick on my sweet, little, insecure 13-year-old daughter because that's always good, right? She got up early this morning, glory be to God, which meant the bathroom was open for the boys. Double glory be to God. But like an hour and a half later, she's still working on that hair. And I'm just dumbfounded by it. And Emily says, well, that's just what girls do. And I love it. I love it. I love it. And I want her to care for her heart just the same. And I want us to get up in the morning and recognize there's a gravitational pull in this world that is to self. To worry about ourselves. To consume. And that we've got to work to serve. 
We've got to work to be agreeable. We've got to work. It's not going to be easy. But we have to work to get along. But so often, we have this attitude of me and Jesus. Like we got this thing worked out and I'm good with him. He's good with me, so I'm okay. And if you get along with me, great. But if it's going to take work, no thank you. God forbid that live in the heart of one redeemed by Christ. Because I have some news for all of us today. Every one of us is hard to get along with. Every one of us tests the Lord. Every one of us needs his mercy and his patience. And aren't you glad the Lord doesn't say, you're hard to get along with, get out of here. I've got no time for you. This is what Paul is articulating. Work it out. It takes work to put aside grumbling and complaining and to grab a hold of living together for the glory of God, for the sake of his gospel and the corporate witness of this church. Yes, we are saved one by one by one as individuals. I cannot make a a saving decision for you. Your parents cannot. Your friends cannot. We can pray to God, but you make that decision individually. But that decision brings you into a family. Okay? So it's not just an individual decision to work out your salvation. It is a corporate reality. We work at these things together. I wonder, probably more than I ought, But I wonder, how often do you consider what we say to our community? Do you ever think about that? Sometimes I think, that person's a member of our church and said that publicly? (laughs) God, please strike that from the mind of this world. That person, a member of our body, our family, acted that way publicly? (laughs) Let no one see it, God. You can do it, please. Do you ever think about your words in regards to the corporate witness? Do you ever think about your actions in regards to the corporate witness? Let me ask you, what are we saying to this community? Because we're saying something. What does our agreement and disagreement say to this community? And Which, by the way, if all we do is agree... We haven't really witnessed the Christ in this community because the message of the gospel is rebel reconciled to God. And so there has to be in a sinful world a degree of disagreement of not getting along. But then the gospel of the grace of the gospel changes us and we get along. The world without the gospel quits when they don't get their way. But we in Christ, we don't quit. We've covenanted with each other and we stick it out. We work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. So I want you to consider from time to time what we say to one another and how it, how it communicates to this world. Because we're following the one that did not look for his own interest, but for your interest, for my interest. He laid down his life. Never forget Jesus died for you. Never get so mature that you don't think long on that reality. Jesus died for you. If that is dull in your heart, pray to God that he would revive your heart. If you've lost the wonder, pray to God that he would return the wonder of the humility of Christ. Because in light of that news of the death of In the resurrection of Jesus, Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. It's sobering. And if we lose sight of the cross and the resurrection, then we lose the weight and the significance of this appeal. With fear, with trembling. My goodness, this passage just told us the whole universe is going to declare the supremacy of Jesus Christ over all. He is Lord. Did that affect you at all this week? In light of last week's time in Philippians chapter 2, did it affect you at all? Every single person you see is going to say with you one day, either either joyfully in this life or bitterly in death and judgment, every one of us will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. That should affect us. That should inspire fear and trembling. All. Be sobered by such 
a reality. And as we sang just a while ago now, it's a privilege to know God and to be known by God. It is a joy to know the Lord and to be known by the Lord. And it's not His will that we live with a sense of dread in drawing near to Him. Listen to me. The gospel is good news, right? Amen? God is the gospel. Like, just let that land on you now. The good news is God. It's just sometimes we're too cotton picking prideful to acknowledge it. We're too self-righteous to acknowledge we need Him. And so it's bad news to us. It's offensive to us. But the good news begins and is uphold and ends in the Lord. And He wants us to draw near in faith and have joy. Thus the fear. Thus the trembling. As we consider these awesome truths. Which then propels us forward with this encouragement that we see in verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Read that again with me. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. The encouragement is God is working in you to supply what you need to work out this salvation. He's not left us as orphans, but he's working in us. And we should say with the Apostle Paul, if God is for us, who can be against us? And it's not primarily like you would think Antifa or ISIS or China if God is for us, who can be against us? You know where that should start and live greatly? In our own hearts. Because who's the greatest accuser in your life? Most likely you are. But God is for you, and he is greater than you. God is with you, and he's stronger than you. This is the encouragement. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you. This passage here gives us who, where, what, and why. Think first, who? God. God is working in us. None other than God. He didn't leave us here to figure it out on our own. He's with us. He's in us. Where? In you. In other words, as one six told us, God began the good work in you and he's going to bring it to completion. Have confidence in that. Have peace with that. Have assurance in that. Be encouraged. God is always working in the heart of his children. Right now. God is working in you. God is forming something in you. What? To will and to work. God empowers the doing and the willing that motivates the doing. I'm going to say that again. This phrase, to will and to work, is saying God empowers the doing and the willing, doing and willing, that motivates the doing. We need to remember, God does not just want our actions. God does not just want our actions. And this is why reading the Old Testament, this is one reason why reading the Old Testament is so beneficial. Israel was really good at the action. Year after year, they had the festivals. They had all the sacrifices. While their hearts were far from God and he rejected, he despised their festivals. God does not just want action. He wants hearts. And so he's working at the level of the heart, at the level of the will. Therefore, the follower of Jesus is not somebody that simply begrudgingly does what God told him to do. That's not a sign of life. Is that, is that, is that a mark of your life? Begrudgingly, you're just doing these things? If you don't have the desire, I want to say do it, okay? Even if you don't have the desire, do it anyway because it's still right. But don't settle for it. Friend, brother, sister, don't settle for it. Fine, are you happy? God, I did it. And Lord, change my heart. I don't want my wife begrudgingly saying, I love you and I'm going to stay with you. Do you think that's healthy? And we think it's healthy when we do that to Jesus. No. Rather, the Lord saved us and changed us so that joyfully, joyfully, willfully, at the heart level, 
We trust in the Lord. We obey for his glory. And why? This is spectacular, you guys. This is a game changer. Why? He says, for his good pleasure. Do you see that? Look at the end of verse 13. To will and to work for his good pleasure. Uh, Confession's good for the soul. I want to confess. June... 1997, the Lord God saved me. So 23 years ago. And I think when I come to the end of my days, this will be the greatest hurdle I ever had to cross. Really believing. Truly receiving. That it is the Lord's good pleasure to keep me. I've struggled all these years to really believe that. And I'm not out of the woods yet. Because so often I feel like I'm a burden to God. And so often I find myself working to not be a burden to God as if God doesn't want me to rely upon Him. This says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work in you to will and to work for His good pleasure. How many of you have been to Chick-fil-A before? Maybe it's easier to say, who's never been to (laughs) Chick-fil-A? You go up to a Chick-fil-A employee and you say, thank you. And they say, what? My pleasure. Whether they mean it or not, they say, my pleasure. This is startling. When you say thank you to the Lord, he says, my pleasure. And he means it every single time. My pleasure. Can Can you receive that this morning? When you say, Lord, thank you for saving me, my pleasure. Lord, thank you for fixing that problem that I created, my pleasure. Lord, thank you for for calming me down when I was anxious, my pleasure. Lord, when I was straying, goodness, and I tested you for those months or perhaps those years, thank you for your patience, my pleasure. Can you receive the good news this morning that you are not a burden to the Lord? But he says to you, my pleasure. Can you believe it is the pleasure of the good shepherd to carry you? It's hard for me because I'm doing my my best I know how to raise my kids to be independent. Go fix your own milk. (laughs) Clean your own room. Wash your own laundry. I don't care. Write your paper. Figure it out. It's awful. And the Lord does not treat me that way, and He does not treat us that way. He does not want us to go pour milk on our own, to go make our bed on our own, to go figure out our problems on our own. He says, come to me. I'll give you rest. For His heart is gentle. His heart is lowly. He's pleased. God is full of pleasure in keeping you. He's full of pleasure in helping you and carrying you. Another way of saying it is God delights in delighting you. God is thrilled to thrill you. He's glad to carry you today. You're not a burden. Would you agree that's an encouragement? (laughs) Would you agree that's an inspiring motivation To work out your salvation now with fear and with trembling. To live out your salvation. You're going to wobble. You're going to fall down and you're going to scuff your knees. You're going to be smart mouthed and you're going to hurt people. You need Jesus. And he says, my pleasure. You see, what I've learned in my years of walking with the Lord, there are, there are really, broadly speaking, two categories of, of followers of Jesus. There's the, the grumpy kind and there's the joyful kind. Or maybe we would say the downcast, sad kind, and those that are full of joy and peace. And that first group, those that are downcast, those that are sad, are so often downcast, not always, but often downcast and sad because they just live for themselves. They're so consumed with just enduring for the day but they never, they never lift their eyes to do the work of an evangelist. They never share the gospel. They rarely intentionally disciple anyone. They rarely set out with the ambition to serve. But rather they look for their own interest at home. 
or in their local community, in their place of employment. And it also comes with them here at the church to be a part of God's family. They just consume. No wonder they're downcast. No wonder they're sad. But there's, there's that second group that's marked by peace and joy so often. And don't believe that that group has an easier life. They have many of the same sorrows and difficulties, tests, temptation, trials that are common to man. But the difference is this group gets up walking daily with the Lord, receiving his word, trusting God to be God and therefore be faithful. And this group gets up to serve with the joy of the Lord as their strength. Why? Because they know the Lord is wonderful. And they know the Lord keeps promise. That is, the Lord is faithful. And in whatever the difficulty is, they will not be alone. But the good Lord will be good in that moment. They remember God is with them. That is, that second group, you know what they don't do? At least rarely. They don't lean on the shovel and pray for a hole. <laughs> Instead, that second group takes that shovel, pauses to pray and trust the Lord. And then they get up with all the grace that he's given them and dig that hole. And then they have a moment in which they say, thank you. And they remember the Lord says, my pleasure. 